Martin and I have just done a series on glycemic index, talking about high and low and why it's important and how you can pick foods that are low and why you shouldn't pick foods that are high. And as we were finishing up, we were just sort of chatting and I thought, well, we should record this. And we're just going to talk a little bit about the state of the union, if I can put it that way, in terms of what we're doing and feeding our populations and really where we need to look at making some changes because uh, it's pretty obvious that the food manufacturers as opposed to the food growers have uh, captured the government, uh, like many other industries, lobbying for what they want. And what they want is cheap food that lasts a long time, high in calories, low in nutrition, because that's the easiest thing for them to manufacture and they don't have to worry about waste as much as they would otherwise and stuff going bad and all the rest of it. And so when you eat a lot of food that has a lot of calories and very little nutrition, Martin, what normally happens? Right. Yeah, to, to repeat or rephrase of what you said, it's the governmental policy that is essentially creating this collapse in the societal health, this this shift from back in 1960s, when you went to the beach, you saw mostly trim, skinny, healthy people. When you come to the beach now in 2020, you see over 50% people who are overweight and a third of them massively overweight. Yes. And it's the policy, the governmental policy that drives it. But what drives the policy is actually money lobby money and who are the biggest uh, sources of lobby money well big agriculture big food manufacturing big pharma big chemical it's it's all the bigger the industry the greater the financial power and so they will drive toward creating a policy that and you said it well it's it's growing foods that are strategically really good for a disaster period, a, a war, essentially. It's Perhaps it's the militaristic mindset that says, well, grain is really easy to store. You grow a bushel of grain, you put it into a silo, and it'll sit there for several years without any problem. Right. It's much harder to store butter, which you have to refrigerate, and it's even more difficult to store vegetables, the only thing you can do with it is chop it up and freeze it, which it's possible, but there's a greater cost associated with it. And I don't know why that is, but the vegetable lobby, like the people who grow cucumbers, broccolis, and green peppers, and similar, seem to have much weaker voice than the people who grow corn, wheat, and soy. Yeah. now have such excess of these materials that we're trying to invent new ways of utilizing it. So we're now turning corn into alcohol, ethanol, which we are now mixing into gasoline at gas stations. Consider the stupidity is that you're actually burning gas on in the tractors in the fields to grow something that you're going to turn back into alcohol to put it into the fuel tanks. Right. The other crazy thing is the HFCS, high fructose corn syrup. Rather than using sugar as we knew it, which comes either from sugar cane or sugar beet, same old good sucrose with a fairly low glycemic index of 70, we're now using HFCS, which is glycemic index of 87, causing all kinds of metabolic problems because the, it's an artificial thing. The metabolic systems in our bodies don't recognize it. Actually, you just bring up a really good point, Martin. Not only are we, you know, growing a lot of the wrong foods, and and but we're also creating things that we eat that's not really food. <laughs> yeah, the food-like substances. <laughs> yeah, the the artificial, we call it the mouth porn, where you are creating the best. Um, combinations of crunch and sweetness and uh, and wetness and uh, fatness, all of those things are lab tested and then 
focus group tested to make it the most seductive piece of nutrition possible so that you go back and eat more. Right. It's almost like creating an addiction. Huh. I remember back when this was probably 1978 or so, when I first encountered Doritos. I've never mm -hmm. seen that before in my life. And uh, I couldn't get enough of it. Like I would open a bag that was like, you know, a half gallon size bag and I would empty it out and it wasn't enough. I wanted more. Yeah. I finally had to just convince myself that I just cannot touch it. So Martin, our body has mechanisms that tell our brain to stop eating, correct? Yeah. Like if you're, if you were only eating apples and carrots and oranges and meat of some sort then you like like for example i was in uh, a small town of, in colombia and a friend of mine said we've got to go to this restaurant it is so good and so we go and it was amazing and i ordered a rack of ribs the rack of ribs were easily a foot long i ate two the equivalent like a two pieces of of uh, bone, like I took two pieces of bone off, ate the meat off of that, and I was done. <laughs> I was like, and it wasn't like it was a massive amount of meat either, but I was like, ah, oh, no, I feel really good. I'm full. So we took the rest of the rack of, of ribs home, and for the next three days, my friend and I, we, we would have like two or three bones, and then we'd be good. Two or three bones, and then we'd be good. There was none of this and I've done the same thing as you. I've had a bag of popcorn or a bag of Doritos, and I just, it until it's done, I don't stop, right? And so there has to be things that they're doing that short-circuit that part of our brain. Because I really, it was very clear. Like, my stomach was telling my brain, that's good. Yep. I am happy. Stop. Yeah. Well, one of those foods is MSG, monosodium glutamate that drives your brain into stimulating wanting more. Mm. So and some of us are actually not very tolerant of it. Like I get a headache or I get a sensation like a heat band all around my head the moment I eat some MSG. It's unmistakable. Right. But anyway, it's put into food to stimulate the uh, I want more. Right. And it's one of the things I think that happens is when you're eating this food all the time, you you get some tolerance to it. And, mm. and because you, you keep not, not tolerance in terms of not eating more of it, but I mean, tolerance in terms of the headaches or whatever happened, because I know a number of people, they stopped eating something that wasn't good. I don't remember what the product was. And then they said, you know, I had a craving for, I don't know, marshmallows, right? Haven't had a marshmallow in five years. And so I had, I've got a bag and I ate three and I felt sick. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. That's when you're, yeah. So when you're, uh, it's when like smoking. You're, yeah. You know, it's like smoking. You smoke the first cigarette you throw up. But if you persist, you'll get used to it. Right. 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 Same right. with coffee. Coffee is a habitual thing, as is alcohol. Right. Like at first, you don't tolerate it. You get yeah. used to it somehow. Right. And they these are poisons. They are. Yeah. In fact, it would be smart if we had regulated alcohol at the same rate, or I, I should flip it, we should regulate sugar as hard as we regulate alcohol and nicotine. There should be full regulation on that. That right. stuff is dangerous. So, Martin, what do you think the average person can do? Because so the big picture is 47% of Americans are obese and 20% plus of those are whatever is bigger than obese. There's a term for it. I More morbidly obese. Yeah. Morbidly obese. Uh, obviously, you know, we don't exercise. We sit in front of computers compared to, you know, 40 years ago. That's one thing. Get more exercise. But, you know, what can the average person do to take control of their life yeah. and get back into a healthy lifestyle? Because yeah. the alternative is, you know, it's kind of, like, you know, that old 
a mechanic commercial. You can pay me now and I'll fix your car or you can pay me later when the car doesn't run. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that now with 40% of people dying who, you know, 40% yeah. of deaths are from cancer. 30% are from heart, disease. Know, heart so disease and, you know, and diabetes is right up there. Yeah. So, well, you know, the, the answer here is uh, glycemic index, which is you have to watch the calories maybe glycemic load is a better word here is how much glucose are you putting in so just the one simple thing if you switch to things that are harder to digest if you switch to eating a lot of fresh fruit fresh vegetables salads stir fries with meat with fat without the grains cut back on rice bread cake all the either all the baked goods all of it just cut it out or just trim it back dramatically anyway you will you will switch the metabolism it won't take long right but you're going to have to spend some time and figure it out because when you go in the grocery store when you walk down the street there's dunkin donuts and yeah. starbucks tempting you and tempting you and tempting you oh my god just about every fast food restaurant is based on something that's a massive brain trigger. It's it's a trap. It is a trap. And we can assume that uh, our government is not going to help us escape the trap. In fact, they're complicit. They're captured just as anything. They, they are completely captured by the, the money interests, financial interests. It's... We need to start from the ground up. We need to start at the street level. The education of the nation has to start with, have you had enough yet? Change it. Right. And unfortunately, when you're young, you think you can eat uh, donuts and drink Coca-Cola until the cows come home. And yep. uh, when you and eventually they do. Yeah. Well, and it's really weird because I, I'm looking around as I'm – walking around Italy and I'm seeing people that are obviously in their thirties and maybe early forties and they're not looking very good, you know? So, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just getting worse and worse and worse. And I think people are going to start having problems earlier, earlier, yeah. earlier, and yeah. you need to take responsibility yourself to yeah. make the changes. Yeah. You know, there's an interesting point. We used to be, in an agrarian society where a lot of people worked in the fields before mechanization, it was hard work. Pitchfork and axe, no, no machines, right. physical work. For that, the farmer diet is just fine. You can eat endless amounts of bread and pizza when you are putting out 5,000 calories a day working hard. But this isn't work. Right. Sitting at your desk, typing on your keyboard, is burning no calories at all. Well, very little, really. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, and you're not getting any exercise, so everything is sitting. Your lymphatic system is getting stagnant. You're breathing, you know, you're compressing your lungs. You're not breathing mm -hmm. quickly. All right. Get a rebounder, bounce mm -hmm. every hour. Go for, a, go for a walk, go for a run. That's Change one of the diet. reasons why Change I your diet. Yeah, sorry, Why sorry. dogs are so important, right? Like the dog comes <laughs> up, whines at you. I got to go pee. Take me out for a walk so I can poop. And, you know, two, three, four times a day, you're going for walks. Right. What I'm doing everywhere I go now, Martin, is I'm taking out my Google Maps and I am looking for a place either one or two kilometers away. And my goal every day is to walk to that place. I want to create the habit of going in the morning before I yeah. eat. I go to that place and then I walk back. And here in Florence, Italy, where I am, it's two kilometers to a fresh pressed juice place where I get a juice with ginger and mm. turmeric in, in it. And Very so that was, like, I go there, my treat is my ginger turmeric juice with I, probably apples and yeah. beets. And, uh, and then I walk back yeah. two a kilometer there, a kilometer back, two kilometers all right. yeah. And I try and do it twice a day, but I haven't succeeded in twice a day. Keep it up. You'll live long and healthy. Yeah. Well, and, that, and the reason I share that is, is that, you know, everybody listening to this, like 
if nothing else, like if you if you're not a gym rat, you're not going to the gym working out on weights, pick a place, a park or someplace, and say figure out the distance and say okay, I'm going to do a kilometer a day. You know, if you're if you're heavier than I am and you're having a tough time with your fitness, go um, you know go less, but work your way up. I I want to work up to five miles, eight kilometers a day. You'll live to a hundred. That's my goal. Thank you, Scott. Right. Thank you, everybody. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.